All right. Um, so we're just going to get started now. So as I mentioned earlier, my name is David. I'm a final year medical student at the University of Leeds. I'm joined by Axel, first year medical student, and uh, also by uh, Chris Amani, who is the uh, boss of <laughs> MedScore. Uh, so today we're bringing you um, this uh, uh, BMAT crash course. We're just kind of going, we know that you guys don't have a lot of time um, uh, left till your BMAT. So we're going to focus on things that you can improve in the short term and also help you gauge kind of where you're at. Um, AXA just did it recently, so she's also going to give you some top tips from somebody who's um, a little bit more, you know, in the game, so to speak. Um, and also, finally, I'm aware that um, I'm, I'm, I need to double check, actually, AXA, is it going to be on online now, the BMAT? Or are they still going to test centers? Yeah, so um, everyone will be going into their schools or test centers, but it okay. will be on a computer. Okay. All right. And obviously that brings a different dynamic to everything as opposed to previously when I did it anyway, it was all um, written on paper. Uh, so yeah, we'll go through some of some of some of those things as well. So um, we're going to start off with just talking about, you know, general background of the BMAT. A lot of you will probably know all this. Um, so to start with, it's two hours long. Um, it's combined knowledge and accuracy test. Um, it's got a writing task mapped by two examiners. So that's the section three. And uh, you get an average from both of them. If there's a marked discrepancy between their marking, um, then um, it gets escalated to a senior, senior uh, assessor who then marks it again. Um, but we'll talk more about that as we go along. So things you're going to be allowed, obviously, black pen, pencil, and eraser, or rubber. Um, but as it's going to be on the computers as well, um, just keep that in mind that you might not necessarily need all these things. Um, I would also double check with whatever school that you're doing it with or whatever um, kind of organization you're doing with to make sure that you know what they want you to bring. So um, what does the BMAT consist of? You guys probably already know a lot of this. Um, it's got three sections, aptitude um, and skills, uh, science and knowledge, and then and application, and then your written task at the end. So for the first section, you have 60 minutes, um, 32 questions uh, to problem solving slash understanding arguments slash data analysis um, slash inference. And we'll talk a bit more about what that means as we go along and it's scored between one and nine. Um, section two is 30 minutes. Um, so this is kind of like your core STEM subjects kind of thing, physics, biochems, uh, biology, chemistry, and physics. Uh, yeah, physics is there twice, but yeah, you get, you get the idea. It's physics, biochemistry, um, chemistry, and biology, sorry. And again, that's, you get a score between one and nine. And then finally, you have your written section um, and you are you have two different points of scoring so you have your zero to five which is kind of the quality of your content and then you have your a to e which is quality of like your written english um i think there's somebody else i need to admit um so just for anybody who's just come in uh, we've just talked through the um kind of what the sections look like Sorry, my, uh, yeah, kind of what the sections looks like. So there's three sections and this is how it's broken down. If you have any questions about that, we can go through that later. So um, this is just a little bit more about the scoring section one and two, what the average is people get. Obviously nine is the most you can get. Um, not many people get nine. Uh, so, uh, well, I don't think anybody gets nine. I don't even think that's possible, but uh, maybe if you're a genius. So average uh, for candidates is about five. Uh, really good candidates normally get um, around a six. And then obviously once you get into seven, 7.5, you're, you're hitting those higher marks out of people who do the, the test for that year. Um, there is no negative marking, so that's good. So one thing I'll discuss in a top tip I'll tell you guys about later is that it's really important to do every question. Um, and uh, so to put things in context, Oxford and Cambridge, their cutoff is uh, six six point two. So if you're scoring anything over a five, like you've you've got a pretty good chance to majority of, of med schools, I would think. Um, so um, most of them are multiple choice in section one. Um, uh, uh, only one 
correct answer unless stated otherwise. Um, wrong answers are incorrect uh, for various reasons. So don't try and like rationalize them. Don't try and say, oh, but this may be the right answer. You know, if it's wrong, it's wrong. Um, uh, there are no half correct or half wrong answers. If it is not stated, it's incorrect. Um, look at the current answers and move on or eliminate all incorrect answers. So this is just in terms of like how to answer your multiple choice. If you know that there's, there's the correct answer, cool, great. If you are not sure, like be solid on the ones you think aren't the correct answers and then work your way to the one that you think is most likely gonna be the right answer. Uh, don't leave any questions unanswered, as I've said earlier, and um, <laughs> have a consistent option uh, for guessing. So like I mentioned earlier, section one is 35 questions and you've got 60 minutes to do them. You normally have a decent bit of time. Um, so yeah, you've got 103 seconds per question. Depends how quickly you work through them. Um, so it's similar to the UK CAT in terms of the aptitude tests and, and what what they're looking for and the kind of way the exercises are uh, organized. So it's just assessing your general problem solving skills, understanding of information uh, and argument, uh, and data analysis and inference. So there's a lot of what is implied, what is the conclusion kind of thing. Um, so some tips that we have here for you are section for section one to do TSA papers. So obviously you guys don't have much time at all anymore, but what you can do is you can either look at the past BMAP papers or use these TSA papers provided by, I believe it's Oxford. Um, and they basically are just a bunch of questions. And so you can, if you really, you know, want to continue to familiarize yourself with what um, you should be expecting in the BMAP, these are a really good uh, source of uh, questions, like just a question bank. And at the end of the day, I hope you guys all know that um, for BMAT and things, the more you practice, uh, the better chance you are of doing okay. Um, so so making, make sure that you're reading through the questions first before you answer it. So you can get just a, a general understanding of what the question is entailing, what the content is of the question. Um, uh, do the questions that you know how to do and leave the one the other ones till later. Now with the um, online thing, the fact that it's online, I'm not sure how that's gonna work in terms of um, if you're gonna be able to go back to previous questions, but I would advise that you inquire um, which, with whatever school or organization you're with as to whether you'd be able to do that. Um, so yeah, read the questions carefully. This is a big thing. Make sure you're reading the questions carefully because a word or two that changes can change the whole meaning of a sentence or the meaning of the paragraph of what they're asking you. Try to leave a bit of time at the end just so you can make sure you've not missed anything out. But again, this is based on the paper, uh, the written version. So on, uh, on the computer, it might be a bit different. And uh, try and keep yourself hydrated and calm. <laughs> so um, here's a further breakdown of kind of the sections. You know, you've got your uh, problem solving, understanding arguments and data analysis and inference. So for the problem solving, which makes about um, half uh, of the, or third of the, of the uh, paper, you've got your selecting relevant information, recognizing analog, uh, analogous cases, sorry, and applying procedures. Um, for your understanding argument section, you've got uh, about 15 minutes to do that bit, reasoning, assumptions and conclusions, detecting flaws and drawing conclusions. Um, and then finally, for your data analysis and inference, we've got verbal, statistical, and geographical. So it's quite, quite a mix. Um, you might need to brush up a bit on your, you know, quick mental maths. That would just help you answer questions quicker. Um, you might need to just um, think outside the box a bit with some of the questions. Um, so average distribution of questions, you've got 35% verbal, 35% logic, and spatial is about 15%. I always like to do the spatial ones because I just thought those are the ones that I, I understood the best. Um, so the three main question types are single answer questions, like I mentioned before, you have some combined answer questions and some long passage questions as well. Uh, so do you wanna add anything at this point, Axa? Um, yeah, so this year, I think for section one, they've taken the questions down to 32, so they've knocked three off. So um, you get slightly longer than people in the in the past few few years did um and also i think a couple of the the multiple questions so the ones where they have um 
different options like one only one only two two three and four that kind of thing i think they've knocked those out as well just, they've just made things a little bit easier um i also think they've taken data analysis and inference down and they've inc they've increased the other questions but everything just to make things easier for you guys but i'd say that in the when you're practicing questions um doing them is not is no harm it'll still help you um with the rest of the questions but so yeah um yeah thanks uh, so a quick overview of some tips uh, for critical thinking. Like I mentioned before, make sure you're reading through the questions. Uh, check if they're asking uh, for um, a conclusion, like to ask you what is the conclusion, what is the inference, you know, thinking about the um, strengths, the weaknesses, um, and some of the assumptions. And so you want to narrow down options by ruling out the ones that are incorrect, like I've already mentioned before. Uh, and like I said, consider the conclusion so if they're asking you for the weakness what is the weakness of the conclusion or if they're asking you for the assumption what is the assumption of the conclusion or that the conclusion makes so have a good idea of kind of like what what the paragraph or what the question is trying to get you to answer or the direction it's trying to get you to go in if there are any more than one appropriate answer related to the question which one is the strongest one so yeah sometimes they might be similar but you just have to think about which one is the strongest in the context of the question? Um, and uh, there's just some practice resources that you can use. Um, so, do you want me to go through this part? Yeah, 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 sure. Uh, so, for the crit critical reasoning section of the uh, section one, so they'll be checking. They'll be asking you two types of questions. So there's the analysis arguments and there's the evaluation to make a valid interference. So analysis arguments tends to be a bit easier, whereas the evaluation uh, type of questions, that's where it requires a bit more thinking, it's a bit more challenging. That's, and that is where you need to um, you know, uh, think a bit more on how to find a conclusion regarding those questions. Go to the next one. You can continue. I just want to. Give oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So, in terms of your um, evaluation arguments, um, so analyze the argument, find arguments or evidence or assumptions, pick key details. So, think about all the key things. It's it's a bit difficult because you can't actually um, highlight on the computers, um, um, uh, and then think about kind of what the argument means and how it correlates to the question. Um, so you have your short passages with, with a one question, um, which are normally easy, find the inference slash conclusion. And then you have your long passages, which are normally three to four questions. So they're a bit longer, you have to read through it and, and uh, then answer a few questions based on it. Um, so in terms of problem solving and data analysis, you said that there's not too much on this anymore as the AXA. Sorry, I think you're muted. Yeah, um, I think they've taken some of the questions out for just because of everything that's happened and made yeah. the exam shorter. So, but um, there was there was like a chunk. If you look in the past papers, there's a chunk of questions um, based on the same kind of topic. There's like three or four. I think that's what they've taken out mostly. But that was quite difficult and what most people would struggle with. So that, I think that's good. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So I would just say, just in general, be good with your quick maths. You know your times tables, your fractions and things like that. And um, yeah, look into the some of the practice stuff that they have available. Um, so methods for critical thinking, first identify the type of question, second find the argument, and finally eliminate and select. It's kind of just a summary of what we've been talking about already. So in terms of spatial reasoning, pardon me. So it's I'm sure you guys have done quite a bit of practices already, so you already know a lot of this. It's your ability to visualize objects from different perspectives, construct and deconstruct two and three D dimensional objects. Uh, three key word categories: so conclusion, evidence, and contrast. Um, you're looking into those wordings uh, in the in um, you know the written written um, reasoning questions. So. In terms of the assessment task, um, which is one of the subtasks in, question, in section section one, 
You're looking to identify the assumptions, conclusions, arguments, flaws, strengthening, strengthening points and weakening points. Again, I know this is a lot of reiteration, but it's just to drill home that these are the key things that you want to be looking at when answering the questions. Uh, Chris, do you want to speak on this a little bit? Yeah. Uh, um, so um, finding the conclusion tends to be uh, the majority of the facts first, uh, one third of section one. So, however, to find the conclusion, you need to be able to identify the evidence and the assumption. So um, let's go through what the conclusion means. The conclusion is mainly what the, the author is trying to imply on the argument. Uh, what is the main point of the author on that specific argument? And it's not always at the end of the, of the passage where the, the author is, is stating this argument. However, you can find the conclusion um, when you see the evidence, once you see the reasons why the author is making this specific argument, they, they will state um, um, a, a, a fact, for example, uh, a historical fact, 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 a survey, and they will provide some uh, information why they want um, a specific type of conclusion to be put into place. So um, in terms of the assumption, that is more to do with uh, your unstated uh, understanding of the, the, the information provided. So you make an assumption on, on the evidence. So you use your assumption as well as the evidence and you try to link them together and that provides the conclusion. So um, let's um, could give an example. Okay, uh, let's say for example, um, I'm feeling sick, therefore I am, uh, I'm feeling sick, therefore I'm going to eat. Uh, I'm going to take some medication. So, um, therefore I'm going to take some medication which has been proven to uh, improve, which has been proven to mediate the sickness um, by the study created in 1990 something. So that, as, that, um, uh, that detail I've just provided of the date and the time when uh, the study which showed that, you know, if I take that medication, will we improve my health? That would be the assumption. So um, then the conclusion is that I will uh, take some medication to feel better. So it's easy if you look for a past paper, uh, past paper where it, it makes more sense. Uh, whilst whilst uh, David is going through the past paper, uh, going through this PowerPoint, I am going to add some questions from um, the uh, from the BMAT website so that you can try and uh, find the conclusion and identify the assumption as well as the, the evidence and the reasons. <clears throat> Yeah. Right. And also, I would say, um, in terms of assumption, if they are, you change the, the conclusion around and it no longer makes sense to the sentence, your, your, the sentence on the argument, then that's when you, you can verify whether the assumption um, is effective or it isn't. But it's easy to, to talk about it with an example. So I, I'm going to add an example to uh, make it a bit easier to understand. Okay. Is there anything else you wanted to add, Axel? No. Okay. I hope that makes sense to everyone. Um, and obviously, um, if need be, you can get in touch with uh, Chris afterwards. I'll add, add an, ex an example. What you okay. can do, I'll add an example. Okay. So that kind of shows you in terms of uh, evidence slash reasoning, um, plus the assumption equals the conclusion. And then this slide is kind of like a breakdown. If you guys can, it's, it was on earlier, so you guys can just read it now. Okay, I'm gonna move on. So argument flaw, imperfections, impairs the soundness of the argument. So this is kind of 
similar to what uh, Chris was talking about. Uh, and there's also absolute numbers v percentages, correlations v causation. Um, so simple, simply a con coincidence slash overlooking alternatives, jumping to conclusions, small sample size, illogical uh, comparisons and projections, increase in price equals extortion. Um, so these are all like flaws in arguments that you can point out when you're when you're looking for answers for questions. Um, so tips is to spot the flaw, put arguments uh, into letters. Um, so for instance, all dogs are mammals, therefore all mammals are dogs. So all A is B, therefore all B is A. So it just helps you kind of understand if the assumption makes sense within the argument. Mm -hmm. Pretty much what Chris was saying already. Mm. Okay, I do have an example here. Is it possible to share my screen? I will find out. Uh, do you guys want to read it by yourself? Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Is everyone, I guess everyone had the time to read it. Or should I read it out for everyone, which makes it a bit easier? I think people just give people a little bit more time. Okay. Okay. Is that enough? Okay, I'll read it through. So fear of death prompts us to develop technology that helps people live longer. But those same technological advances have condemned us to fear of if infirmity and dementia. Since so many of us will live to an advanced age as to eliminate this new fear, once we have reached old age, we should be assisted to die if we choose death over a sad decline. According to Current estimate, dementia affects almost 50% of people by the age of 85, and bodily inf infirmity, infirmity is guaranteed to develop further the older we get. This is not cure for older people. So which one of the best, which of the following best expresses the main conclusion of the, of the above argument? Now we have to look at uh, uh, which one of these information uh, strengthens the argument or the, of, the offer. So uh, from, from reading this, we can see that the author, so as from reading this, we can see from here, right? That's when they start providing uh, strengthening argument. So, um, so let read this part. So as to eliminate this new fear, once we have reached old age, we should be assisted to, uh, uh, to die if we choose a death over a sad decline, according to the current estimate of dementia. So now you can see from here, he's using some information from um, external information to try and back up the reason why uh, we should be assisted to die if we choose death. So that's what um, the reasons, that's what the evidence is. Mm -hmm. So when you see external um, uh, additional information, which strengthens the argument, then you, you understand what the conclusion can be. Uh, so from there, if you look at each of, each of the, an, the answers, A says technology has advanced to the point where we cannot choose when to die. That does not help uh, the conclusion of the, of the offer because the offer thinks that um, we, uh, it's better um, it's better to die uh, than to decline, to have a decline in health. So what else uh, is a better conclusion? Euthanasia should be readily available to people who have reached a certain age, okay? So we have this one, then we have the third one, fear of infirmity and dementia is worse than the fear of death. That still doesn't, it is close to the, to the, to be, but it does not really strengthen the, the, the argument or the offer. We must develop a technology that, that's again, does not answer the question, does not provide a, a clear conclusion. 
and we should focus on health of the young. And that's just external information. So any external information is invalid. So um, th that therefore, B would be the most ideal answer. Though it might seem as it's not as we're using the word euthanasia, it is still the because it is still the ideal answer as euthanasia is the ability to to um, uh, decide when you can you can pass away. So um, so hence this makes the ideal answer for it as the ideal conclusion. And uh, yeah, I think I've said enough for that one, right? Yeah, sounds good to me. Great. Do you, uh, do you want to make me a host again so I can screen share? Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> I just thought it would be better to, to do with an example. Yeah, that was a good example. Number floor. So this one says there are 20% <laughs> of apartments available in Manchester City Centre at the price of $400, while there are two thirds of houses in Fallowfield available to, the, to rent at the same price. Hence, it would be easier for a student to rent in Fallowfield as there are more accommodations available. So the so reading this through, what is the flaw? Well, we can see that the flaw is um, anywhere unaware of the exact number of houses. So there's there's been an assumption, well, a flaw um, in the assumption of how many houses there are. So you can't make that conclusion without first having more information. So that would be an example of kind of finding a flaw in um, a number flaw, for instance, in uh, this type of uh, scenario, this type of question. Um, did you want to have add another example, Chris, at this point? So let me reiterate uh, what a flaw is. So a flaw can be an imperfection and impaired to the soundness of the argument. So, um, so for example, a flaw can be seen in, a, in in absolute number of percentages if uh, it changes the the assumption. Of the uh, of the argument, so uh, let's check this question. This is from the ESSER, um, no, from the BMAT uh, official website. So uh, I'll give you like a, a minute to read it. I would say instead of putting your answer there for everyone, uh, try and send it to David. That way, uh, other people have the opportunity to not see your answer and give the answer. So for this argument, um, um, Chris, I think they've put some answers in the chat box. Um, a couple okay. of them have said it's D. All right, great. Um, the, okay, uh, D is the right is the correct answer. What I would say before even you answer a question, right, is that when you're reading it, try and create a mental understanding of what the question what the, the, the question is, is saying. What are you really understanding? Because at times we read through things and we don't really try to understand what the whole question is saying. So um, yeah, and every time when you read and you finish a paragraph, try to think for one second, okay, cool. What is the, the summary of that question, of, of that uh, sentence? So anyway, uh, in terms of the flow, uh, yes, D is the correct one because uh, the question says that uh, students are going out of school for two weeks holiday every year. Then, you know, the the argument 
that is on this question is that um, you know it is against the law for them to 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 do so. However, the flow on question D on answer D, uh, it is based entirely entirely on one exam of the daughter and generalize uh, and generalizes from them. Okay. Um, Let's see at let, let's see at all all the other answers. The first one is it is it is an appeal to tradition because it suggests that taking children on holiday in term time used to be acceptable. So that does not uh, give a flow to the argument. If anyone can uh, answer why they would think that it doesn't give a flow, then that would be great. But if you want to stay silent, then by all means, it's, it's fine. Okay, no one's, someone's saying something? Feel free to talk and type, guys. Yeah, feel free to talk. Let's try and interact a bit. No, okay, that's fine. That's the- <laughs> You tried, Chris, you tried. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, the uh, second one, it is based on of authority. It is, it, it uses the administrator's lack of objection in, in support. But again, it does not provide a flow, a, a, a flow to the argument. Um, you know, it doesn't, yeah, it does not at all. Yeah, I think that, 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 that answer though is not necessarily, how do I put it? Um, it's 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 a true statement, but it doesn't answer the question. You know what I mean? It's a it's a accurate statement, fair enough, accurate opinion, but it doesn't necessarily answer the question of highlighting the flaw. So there will be answers like that that sound right in terms of like, oh yeah, that's right. It's not based on authority. Uh, it's based on an authority as it uses the headmistress' lack of objection and support. Yeah, that's true, but it's not. I was going to ask why is it? I was going to ask why is it C? Well, why is it not C? Okay, we'll go through it, and um, so we've just done A and B, so we're going to touch on C now as well. Oh, why it, it is C? Why is it? No, not why is it not C? Uh, oh, why is it not C? Okay. Yeah, why is it not C? Uh, yeah. So C says it's, it assumes that because the daughter's good grades were achieved after her foreign holiday, they were a result of the holidays. Because it does touch, it does touch upon that. It does. But I think the difference between C and D is that um, it's not it's not the flaw that actually, how do I put it? That, that it's not it's not the strongest flaw in the argument, basically. So the first, if if you notice, she it says she was able to learn a foreign language and spend some some rewarding time with her fr uh, French pen pal. She eventually achieved top grades at school and a degree in mathematics. And you have to, you remember earlier on the headmistress said that uh, she had no objection because it would be a good time for the kids, uh, the other kids, to catch up. Um, and basically with that 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 idea that actually her missing school and her going on holiday is what has helped her get top marks it, that doesn't even make sense does that make sense like you miss school has helped you get better grades when the headmistress has just said that it's going to help the other kids catch up so actually she's saying that you won't actually get any better the other kids are just going to get better as well does that make sense yeah, kind of. Um, yeah. Um, it, do you know how to maybe articulate that better, Chris? I'm trying to find a better way to articulate it. Because the headmistress has just said, the headmistress, it says the headmistress made no objections and said it would give the other kids time to catch up with her. So the fact that she's left school has given the other kids time to catch up, which means she would have been more stagnant in her learning. 
So for the number C, so, 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 so it kind of like contradicts itself because. Exactly. All right. So that's why we, we can eliminate C because of that reason. Yeah, because it's it's it doesn't fl flow with the actual. It's not a flaw of the argument that the mom is making. It, it's just a flaw. It's it, it it's it doesn't even make sense to the question. Um, to the to the scenario, to the question. Sorry. So it, says, it seems that because the daughter's good grades were achieved after her foreign travel, they were the result of the holidays. But that it doesn't assume that though. No. It assumes the exact opposite. So it can't be a flaw of the argument. It's it's contradictory to the entire argument. And before it's yeah, I I, I uh, was it um I try to look now. She eventually got top grades. She assumed it got a good grade. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, it makes it makes more sense now because it contradicts itself. Yeah, it actually contradicts the scenario itself. Because because the headmistress has said before that they'll you know the other kids could catch up with it. That's that's actually saying well actually they're gonna get better grades in there. Yeah, exactly. Um, and we're just assuming that she'll get better grades by you know going on holiday. Exactly. So it's an assumption, not a conclusion. Yeah. yeah okay. Makes and sense. Also yeah. inserting. Um, you're also ex inserting external information to the question, an external <laughs> assumption, yeah. So when, when you approach a floor question, what's the first thing you, you'd like to do when you're approaching one? Like, would you start eliminating first, like the other options or? There are a variety of ways to do it. Axa, do you have any specific ways you, you want to talk about before? Yeah, I mean, I would say the best way is to just give it a good read first and then start off with eliminating the ones that you know are not true. Um, and then after you've done that, you just need to understand that most of them are quite similar. They've done that on purpose to trip to trip you up. So um, it, usually it comes down to two and then the two of them you can look at in detail. So the f a couple of them are quite general and you can automatically just say it's not that. But then the last two, just read them really carefully and then it comes between them two. Okay, thank um, you. I would say, um, if you look at that question, the f uh, D, it, it, it does um, touch on to the, one of the examples we gave for the flow, as we said, uh, the correlation with causation. Mm -hmm. So that could be one of them by just looking at the question, uh, just looking at the, it is based entirely on one example of the daughter and generalized from that. You see, okay. that could yeah. be a quick one without thinking too much into it um what what what's the what would you say the conclusion of this um or, you know argument would be um okay um would you say you know would it be something to do with like her getting um better grades by going abroad or you know because that's what it says at the end but in the beginning it says about headmistress said that the other kids will catch up so then it, as, as i say contradicts itself. so what's like the main conclusion of this passage if it was to be a conclusion question so the conclusion here would be the law of being penalized for removing your kids or yeah. taking your children on holiday during term time is unnecessary that is the okay. And the evidence they provided was an anecdotal evidence of her daughter being taken out. The headmistress didn't mind because she said it would be a good time for the other kids to catch up. Yeah. And then she came back and she got excellent grades. But that's a flaw. That that's not that's not. Good. Yeah, that's just one example. Yeah. yeah. So it's just right. it's and that makes sense now because actually by knowing what the conclusion is, you can then find out what the flaw is. Yeah. Makes a lot more sense. Yeah. It makes yeah. sense. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. No problem. If it, does anybody else want any clarification on that? Feel free to to type in the chat box or anything like that. So, um, but I think we'll move on. I'm just conscious of time. Um, but yeah. So just be aware of what the passage is asking. Kind of reword it in your, and see if it still makes sense. Um, when you consider the conclusion and if you're highlighting the conclusion find you know summarize and find the conclusion if you're looking for a flaw um, um then make sure that you understand the context in which the answer the in which you're being asked the question therefore you understand what answers would make sense so you're not looking for a contradictory argument you're looking for a flaw in her argument so a and b are pretty much um you know they're not really 
didn't really add to it. C, similar, but actually, if you look at it in the context of the text, it contradicts. And E, it assumes that learning some French adequately compensated for the work the daughter missed. And okay. that, again, is contradictory. Again, if you look, put it in the context, if that makes sense. So D is the only one that's actually strengthening the argument, but what is ad it's adequately and appropriately identifying the flaw in the argument and not contradicting it, if that makes sense. I, I don't want to add too many more words to that just in case I uh, <laughs> confuse you even more. But uh, yeah. Why don't we do another one? Uh, question, should we do another one before sure. moving? If you want to. Uh, question, uh, 10? Go on, question 10. Okay. <laughs> we just see. So I can read it out. So the decline in voters turnout at elections is chiefly explained by the decline in voting by younger people. Older people are much more likely to vote. If this trend continues, we will reach a point at which no government can be said to have a mandate um, to govern as the number of votes will be too small to indicate the wishes of the majority. We need therefore to find an alternative to conventional elections so that the wishes of the people can be heard. Which one of the following best expresses the flaw in this above argument? So A, there may be a problem in using alternatives such as internet and postal voting. B, young people may be more likely to join a pressure group than to vote in an election. C, all European countries have seen a decline in voter turnout. D, elections are used in all democratic countries as a way of choosing a government. E, people who are young now may become more likely to vote as they get older. So if you wanna send the answers to me private in a private message, or just give us, maybe just give us, give everybody a few minutes and then we'll, we'll go through it. All right, I think that may be enough time. Um, so the first question I wanna ask everyone is, what is the conclusion from this well, passage? We've got a few answers. Oh, great, fantastic. So we'll have a look at those. But firstly, I wanna ask, what is the conclusion from this, from this uh, question? Anybody wanna hazard or be brave enough to put their mic on and, and have a go? <clears throat> following Sam's footsteps. Anyone at all? Well, what is an overview of the, the passage as well? What, what um, is it to do with the, you know, like, because of older people are more likely to vote, that's the, that's the problem. So what we've got to find a solution to that problem by, you know, you know making it more fairer. And is that, is that why? I don't, I, don't, I don't really know. Is that why? Really why? We've got another answer for the conclusion as well. Um, it's from Mazeb. Um, we need to find an alternative way for young people to walk. Yeah, yeah. So that's definitely along the right tracks. So... To be honest, I think if you remove all the middle section and you just say the decline in voter turnout at elections is chiefly explained by the decline in voting by younger people. Therefore, to find, we need to find an alternative to conventional elections so that the wishes of the people can be heard. Does that make sense? Would you guys agree with that, uh, Chris and Axa? Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes sense. 
So that, that's our conclusion that we're working from. So we want to have that in, in our minds as we're looking for the floor. So a lot of people have mentioned E and I saw somebody mention A as well. So let's, let's just go through them. So the first one, there may be a problem in using alternatives such as internet and postal voting. Doesn't, doesn't answer the argument, does not provide anything at all. Yeah, does that make sense to everyone? Okay, so the next one, if that doesn't make sense, just post on the chat. The next one is young people may be more likely to join a pressure group than to vote in an election. That's that one is completely irrelevant to <laughs> the topic. So all European countries have seen a decline in voting in voter turnout. There's no there's no mention of European countries. Yeah. No. Um, elections are used in all democratic countries as a way of choosing a government. Anybody have any yays or nay to that one? Nope. Um, no? Okay. No, no um, I would say that focuses more on, on Democrats and it doesn't address the, the question. It doesn't strengthen or, or weaken the, uh, the argument. It really doesn't say anything, does it? Does it? Does it address any of the what the question is asking for? Does it address that there's an issue with uh, with the number of younger people voting? No, it does not. It's just a statement. Yes, you see. Now, now we're getting there. People are getting involved. That's great. Yeah, exactly. Fantastic. So E is the one that most addresses the actual question and shows that there is a flaw in the assumption that is being made to answer the question. Does that make sense to everyone? So people who are young now may become more likely to vote as they get older. So that's a, they, they, they've not, they've not, they've not expressed that, they've not taken that into consideration. That yes, people are young now, but as they get older, they're gonna be more likely to vote because now they are the older people that voting is talking about. Okay. Okay. Axa, do you want to add anything to that at all in terms of, you know, the question, how to no, answer? I think that's. I think that was quite a straightforward question. I think most <laughs> of the, um, most of the answers have. I mean, the first one has stuff about internet and postal voting. It didn't mention anything about internet. There's something about European countries. It didn't mention anything about that. So you can automatically eliminate eliminate those. And then E is is very fitting. So I think, yeah, it's all right. It's straightforward. Fantastic. Okay, um, we did touch onto the assumptions uh, style of questions, but we didn't do an example for it. Should okay. we try one and see uh, how people um, uh, answer them? How we answer these questions? Chris, I think we've got a question about that question, so you might want to go back to it. Uh, pardon? I think we've got a question. Oh, uh, let's try question four. Okay. All right. But before we go into that, uh, do you want to touch on to the assumption again, or do we just do the question? I think we've got a question about question 10. Okay. okay. What, what was the question, sorry. sorry? I can't see it. Um, so, oh, she sent it privately to me. How does that solve the flaw? Because if young people get older and what they'll be, they'll still be young people. So the percentage of voters will still be the same, right? Um, Anissa, I think you might want to send it to everyone. It will be easier for the rest to see. Oh, I see. Uh, okay, cool. Let's let me do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can follow on the. On. Do you want to answer the question, um, Axa? Or don't quite understand the question. <laughs> Let's go to it. Or should we move on and then we can come back to it later? Um. What do you think, Chris? I'm just conscious of time. I don't want us to. Oh, um, yeah. Okay, cool. Let me. Um, yeah, we've explained it. Right? Do you mind just posting it back in the chat? So if you can copy and paste it back into the chat, so that would be helpful. Just so we can all see it. 
I've posted the, pow the, the, the past paper on the chart. There you go. Okay, so it says, how does that solve the flaw? Because if people, if younger people get older and vote, they'll still be young people. So the percentage of voters would still be the same, right? Because it's making an assumption that because yeah, um, it says mandate so the government of the number of voters will become too small. So it's saying that it, it's making an assumption that like people who are young are going to stay young forever. So obviously people who are young get older and they start to vote, the voting population is not going to decrease because the, there's going to be more older people. It's not like a, gen, a gradual decline, if that makes sense. So people who are young now may become more likely to vote as they get older. So you will always have people voting. If you have young people voting, they're more likely to vote when they're older. I mean, if you have young people who are getting older and if young people, if older people vote, then there will always be people voting. Does that make sense? Because as much as there's always gonna be younger people, there's always gonna be older people as well. So to say there's gonna be a continuous decline is to say that there's not gonna be any new old people, that people are just gonna stay young forever and not be inclined to vote. And even when they do get older, they're not gonna be inclined to vote. But that's contradictory to what they said at the beginning. Older people are much more likely to vote. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, she said it makes sense. Okay, great. Oh, great. All right, Chris, let's do one more. And then I'm just conscious because I do want to get to that last bit um, and not take too, people's time too much. OK, great. Uh, question number four, please. Uh, so I can read it out. Uh, mobile phones use and mobile phone, phone use and driving under the influence of alcohol are not the only example of irresponsible driver behavior. Tiredness when driving a vehicle is said to be responsible for 300 deaths per year. Astonishingly, almost half of male drivers and 22% of female drivers admit to having fallen asleep at the wheel. If we assume, and it seems to be reasonable to do so, that even more people are injured than killed as a result of accidents caused by tiredness, it is clear that tiredness while driving is a major road safety issue and entirely preventable if we and entirely preventable. If we wish to preserve our own lives and, th and those of others, we should not drive a car knowing that we had an insufficient sleep. We had insufficient sleep or rest to drive safely. Which one of the following is an underlying assumption of the above argument? So you guys wanna just read the... Um... All right, Chris, do you want to take this one? Um, <clears throat> I didn't even read it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let me have a quick read. Um, do you want me to go through it? Yeah, sure. Well, um, but I don't have the answer, so I don't want to guide them the wrong way. Is it B? <laughs> I'm, do you have the answer, Chris? I, I would have yeah. chosen B. Yeah, so well, I would say, let's go back to what is an assumption, right? Mm -hmm. is an underlying statement which uh, supports the, the evidence. So um, if you, yeah. I mean, if you go through, if you look at question, uh, answer A is talking about women rather than men um, and about how careful they are driving and there's no mention about um, whether they're careful or not. And there's nothing, I mean, it tells us that half of male drivers and 22% of female drivers, but um, that it says nothing about who's a better driver, who who's more careful. So I think we can eliminate A. And then um, C, it talks about mobile phones and there's nothing, there's no mention about mobile phones. So you can eliminate C. Um, 
D tells us about jobs. There's nothing about jobs. You can eliminate that. And then E and B are probably the last ones. But um, although there's like a slight mention about um, ass assuming about, you know, about kind of about road safety campaigns, there's not enough. I think you can just from elimination, you can go down to B. But then if you actually look at B, it says drivers, drivers are able to recognize when they are dangerously tired. Um, it said, and then if you look at the last line or last sentence of the passage, it says, if we wish to prevent our own, preserve our own lives and those of others, we should not drive a car knowing that we have had insufficient sleep, sleep or rest to drive safely. It is assuming that um, most people are able to recognize when they are tired before driving. So that just takes it down to B. That's, that's good explanation. Does that make sense for everyone? E is a close second, just to be to be fair. E is a close second. But if you look at it within the context of the question, and I mean the context of, yeah, of the question as in question four, you see how it's not necessarily actually um, a, a firm assumption to be made. It doesn't lead to that end conclusion. Because again, remember, we have to say, okay, so what is the conclusion? What are they trying to say? The conclusion is that because mob, um, phones are not really, um, sorry, one second. Um, yeah, yeah, so um, it basically, it, said, it talks about phones and alcohol and how those things are well known, but mm -hmm. then how tiredness is not well known. So that's where E and B come into consideration. But then the actual end, sentence like like access said is more pointing towards the fact that the rule should be made that there should be a rule made that if you realize you haven't slept enough you should not drive but that's putting a lot of emphasis on the individual as opposed I was to gonna, the i was gonna ask something um what's the difference between a conclusion and an assumption so a conclusion is the state, it's, it's, it's an evidence statement. So remember, assumption is not actually there, but a conclusion is what the person's actually said in the text. So for instance, I can make a conclusion that um, um, trees that grow apples, all the trees I've seen have grow, that grow apples have always grown red apples. So all apples must be red. <clears throat> That's a conclusion. That's that's my conclusion. All apples must be red. But actually, that's based on the assumption that all the trees I've seen is representative of all the trees in the world. Mm. Does that make sense? That mm, sounded like mm, I'm not. Yeah, sure. that, yeah, <laughs> that, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So an assumption is not something that's directly in state, directly stated, but is implied. Through the um, yeah. Okay. So let's uh, move on. If we have time at the end, we can go through some more questions. But I'm just, I just want us to make sure we get through all the slides. So that that's the floor question. Um. So you, like we've already mentioned as we were going through it, you know, we want. Uh, to identify what's strengthening and what's weakening the, the arguments, what what is adding or boosting the premise, or what is um, taking away from the premise, and that will help guide us to understand what the conclusions are, what the flaws are. Um, then you have your long passage uh, questions. So, you, uh, can you put the PowerPoint off, please? PowerPoint off. Up. Up. Oh, you yeah. can't see it. No. You'd show your screen. Oh, apologies. I thought you could see my screen. Can you see it now? Yes. Yep. Okay, so this is what I was talking about earlier, guys. Um, so, um, yeah. All right. So adding um, slash boosting the premise, strengthening the argument. Um, oh, I think somebody's writing. Do you mind not writing on the screen? <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah, anyway. So, yeah, so adding slash boosting the premise, strengthening the argument. 
uh, by adding a sentence yeah. agreeing to the argument <laughs> or removing slash shrinking the premise. All right. Weakening it. That's so. Funny. I think Sam, you need to mute your mic. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so. So yeah, just be just be aware of when you're looking at flaws, when you're looking at um, uh, conclusions, and be aware of what's strengthening and what's weakening the argument. Um, so long passage questions is the next part. Um, so you have one or two passages, and then you have three to four questions related to that long passage. Um, it could be a mathematical question or verbal, or you could have a mixture of both. So some tips are to scan through the passage and just highlight, obviously, again, you don't have the luxury of having paper, so you can't really write stuff down in the same way as you might have been able to. Um, but just mentally highlight, and I don't know if they'll have that ability on the computer, but highlight kind of the key things or get a general key idea of what um, the passage is saying. And then understand what the question is asking you as well. So, um, long passage in long passages what you want to look for is conclusive evidence anecdotal evidence um statistical evidence you want to look for the irrelevant evidence and you want to look for the hearsay so unverified unofficial information gained from uh and and you know external party um so in long passages you also want to look for the conclusion, assumption, strengthening and weakening points to the arguments and also the flaws. So in both short and long answers, you wanna be looking at, you know, the general theme of the question. You wanna be looking at what is the conclusion they're trying to come to? What is the assumptions that are being made? What arguments are they making and how are they strengthening or weakening the, the, um, the, the conclusion? And then also what flaws might there be in the arguments? You always wanna be doing that when looking through the questions. Um, is there anything else you wanted to add there, Axel? No, I think it's all right. Okay. Um, so then conclusion tips. Uh, don't confuse a, pr a premise with a conclusion. A conclusion vis the premise. Uh, some, so do you want to explain that a bit more, actually, Chris? A conclusion vis the premise. Um, a conclusion, the, the conclusion. Um, well, because they can ask you a, a conclusion regarding one part of the argument, or they can also ask you a conclusion regarding the, or the whole um, essay, the whole argument, the whole passage. So yeah, that's literally what it means. Okay. Um, so in terms of correlation, it's not the same in causation. So there's a lot of times uh, that is more to do with, uh, um finding a flaw in the argument so and yeah you cannot make a conclusion if there's a correlation it it, it, don't, it doesn't really provide the conclusion it doesn't provide a causation for it and i'm sure a lot of you have done science so you're aware of the difference in correlation so just to highlight so correlation is something that happens at the same time causation is something that happens because of something else um, so yeah, again, thinking about, um, weakening arguments, um, that remove from the premise and strengthening arguments that add to the premise. Um, yeah, I think that's that for conclusion. Yeah. So, uh, for the over, so just an overview of logical reasoning, ability to use uh, logic and basic mathematical principles to solve problems. So this is where your mental maths, your ability to round up, your use of fractions comes into play. So are you able to think on the spot and apply principles, sequences, data interpretation, uh, partial table questions, speed, distance, and time, uh, date uh, and time, and then alphabetical uh, alphabet questions as well. So things that you need to keep in mind, some definitions, med, mean, median, and mode. So mean is a sum of numbers, um, all of the data. Um, so a disadvantage is the number uh, at, the extreme, at the extreme ends can be skewed. So it's not always um, 
an accurate representation depending on what context you're using it in. Median is the middle number uh, in a group from high to low. Uh, it's an, so it basically finds the middle. So you arrange everything up and down and then you find the middle. Um, the disadvantage of this, this method is that it can be time consuming. And the mode is the most, uh, the number that occurs the most. So if you had 10 people and three of them got a score of two, one of them got a score of 10, but most people, like um, five people got a score of five, five would be the mode. Um, so, but one of the disadvantages is that um, may be less than one or not representative. So it, it doesn't always represent the full picture of what's going on. So just good definitions to be aware of. Um, so I don't think, if we have time at the end, we'll go through some examples, but basically just be aware that you need to be good with your mental maths um, again, you don't have much time, so um, just keep going through practice questions um, and try and understand like the, the general principles. Some, there's some key principles that you can carry through. Always try and understand what the question is they're trying to ask you and aim to answer the question. When you're answering questions, answer the question. As silly as that might sound, sometimes you answer, but the answer is not the answer to the question you've been asked. So it's always important to try and answer the actual question and base how you approach the question that you've been asked in a way that is to answer the question that you've been asked. I, I feel like I'm going around in circles, but it's just really important that you get that because I, I know like even me in when I do like multiple choice stuff and when I did my BMAT, like that was something that I always had to remind myself, answer the question, answer the question, answer the question. Uh, so yeah, that's section one. Section two, we're really not going to touch on this too much because in all honesty, there's not much that we can do in terms of prepping you. Uh, Chris told me that he will release kind of like um, uh, uh, some documents for you to have a look at, but you don't have much time at this point. So I would just say brush up on what you know, know what you know. And if you don't know it, it's probably not the time to start trying to learn these things now. Just try and really maximize on the things that you know you're good at. Um, so, yeah, there's, tw tw I think you said there's less questions down in this section. Oh no, that was uh, section one. Yeah, no, so, only section one. So there's 27 questions, you have 30 minutes. So this, this section, and we'll go into more details about it, but this section is not really about, is as much about your time management as it is about your knowledge. So yes, you need to know how to do your math, your, 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 your sciences, but you also need to know how to manage your time well. You don't have much time for each question. So it's a bit of a blitz through. You need to really, if you don't know it, move on and just get onto the next question and do the questions you know. Again, I'm not sure how that's gonna work in terms of being on the computer. So that's something that I would ask. Are you allowed to go back um, to previous questions if you've done them or if you haven't done them? That's definitely something you wanna ask. And also, are you allowed to bring in some paper with you so you can jot things down to help? Um, yeah, so they can either take some paper with them or they'll be giving some. And um, at the format's going to remain the same, so I think they will be able to go back to Okay, questions. good, good, good. Um, so some key tips. Obviously, you have to learn your GCSE level and on, you know, maths and your sciences as well. Uh, for biology, make sure you know your digestive, respiratory, cardiovascular. And reproductive um, and things of, like know the systems um yeah for chemistry know your periodic table how to balance equations um and um do your easy questions first because you don't have much time so this is just a breakdown of some of the things they can ask you and some of the things that you might need to know um again i don't see much point in going through this um too much because there's not much time for you to prep now in, in addition to what you've probably already done. So I'm just gonna leave this on for 10 seconds. You can read through it. There's nothing I really have to highlight on this. Access, is there anything you have to highlight on this or? No, I mean, they get the PowerPoint later on anyway, so um, yeah. they can have a look in their own time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, biology, we've kind of touched on it briefly. Um, chemistry is quite a few calculations. Just know your calculations know your formulas and things like that. Um, factual recall, just again, these are things that you, there's nothing much we can like give you top tips on on this. Just be aware of your timing, do the easy stuff first really. And you'll get the slides for this anyway. 
maths, know your equations, um, brush up on your maths uh, in terms of, you know, uh, solving questions quickly. And obviously, if you have your mental maths um, up to scratch, that will help you as well. Know um, the units. Yeah, that's something that you can do. Uh, you can make sure you do know the units, know mass in kilograms, and know how to um, be aware that you may need to convert them between grams, kilograms, and things like that. Know the conversion rates. No force is in newtons, accelerations in meters, second squared. Um, yeah. So fractions always come up. That's something I've said uh, quite a, couple, a couple of times now. So know your fractions if you can. Practice them, practice them, practice them. I hope you've been practicing them already. Your mental maths, like I've said, practice your mental maths. Um, for physics, you need to know your formulas. What, so I've just got a question. What do you mean by don't expand? Expand what? I don't think I mentioned expand. I, I might have said don't take too much time. Uh, do not expand brackets in the maths bit. Oh, oh, I see what you mean. Expand as in oh. show. Where? Yeah, I think, I think if you expand the brackets, you end up with a lot of um, big numbers and lots of letters. And I think it's just easier to cancel stuff out um, whilst they're in brackets. Does that answer your question, Sam? I'll take that as a yes, unless you, oh, okay. Good. Um, so yeah, so some topics, assume knowledge guide, you need to know these things because they come up often, heat and temperature, waves and effects, energy and force, electricity, the atom, and uh, radioactivity, um, and, uh, some other applications for, for physics. But if you know these main ones, especially the ones that are in bold, those are the ones that pretty much always come up. So be aware of the units, be aware of questions that are gonna be asked that are similar around that. If you need your GCSE books, flick back through those. But I'm gonna assume that you guys have um, <laughs> brushed up on that before this point, um, because obviously you don't have much time. Um, so yeah, if you do need um, any resources, you've got, you know, BMAT website, BBC Bite Size, practice under timed conditions is really important. For this section, practicing under timed conditions is the most important actually. So even if you do like um, in a day, if you wanna do like three or four sessions, so that's what, two hours for the day. So if you do one in the morning and then, cause it's only 30 minutes, right? So you do one in the morning, do one just before lunch, take a break and practice something else and then do one in the evening. So you could do three sessions in a day and therefore you've gone through what, um, in three days you've done almost, you know, five, five hours plus of, of, um, of uh, almost five hours, sorry, of uh, practicing before. Um, but what I would say is right now, because it's such a hard thing to get right, I would say focus on section one and focus on section three because those are the sections that you can really score very well on and that you can really utilize those top tips. Uh, at this point, I think in terms of section two, if you know it, you know it. If you don't know it, it's gonna be pretty hard to cram everything now considering balancing everything. I would say probably um, strengthen what you know. So make sure you know what you know well. And if you don't know things, just if you can get a vague idea so you can guess well, <laughs> then, then that's what I would say. Anything to add to that, Axa? Um, no, same same as what you've just said with sciences. Just if you don't know it, don't get bogged down because you you only have about a minute, I think, per question, and it's really easy to spend five minutes on a physics question that you're not going to get right. So just move on. Yeah, I would say at least understand how to use the equations. If you understand how to use them, that that would be good enough. If you yeah. don't know anything about it. So these are some uh, equations that are important to know. Um, yeah, I mean, you're gonna get these slides, so just note these equations. <laughs> and uh, most of the equations are online, really. So yeah. um, use Google, uh, BMAT equations, they're all there. So yeah. that's why we did add all of them on the PowerPoint, because you can just Google all the equations. Right. Fantastic, so uh, that's all in question two. Does anybody have any questions uh, for quest uh, section two, sorry? Anybody have any questions for section two? If you do just put them in the chat, um, I'll move on though.
<laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so for this section to really be looked at by majority of the medical schools that you'll be applying for, you do want a three. Um, a, I've, it's it's three A here, but you want a three A, three B. You probably be okay. Um, it, it's pretty hard to get anything less than a three C, unless you literally write in like backwards English or something. I don't know. Um, but if you've you know if you've done English, you you'll be fine. Um, so, like I said before, they break it down into the number you get. And they break it down, and also the the letter you get. So the letter is for your use of the English language, and then your number is for the gram uh, is for the content, the actual content of what you're writing. So to get to three, you just need to answer all the parts of the question. So there may be two parts of the question, there may be three parts of the question. So you just need to answer the parts of the question. So answer the main question and the title and then answer the sub questions that they ask you um, under that main question. Um, if you answer all of the questions, you should get a three. What takes you to a four and a five is how well you answer them. You know, the use of language that you use maybe, you know, if you add a little bit of salt to it, you know, um, that, that's what, um, that's what uh, separates from three and, and, and four and five. Um, so yeah, so as I mentioned, it's a score out of five. All aspects of the questions must be answered. So yeah, these are the key traits of a score five answer. All aspects of the question must be answered. Excellent use of material, excellent count, uh, counter propositions. So you know, good balanced arguments um, um, and good balanced arguments that make sense um, and that you've involved a breadth of relevant points and it's a compelling conclusion that ties what you've said nicely together. Um, uh, and really not just summarizes, but leaves an impactful um, mark based on the evidence that you've provided. The conclusion is not somewhere to be bringing in new information. It's somewhere to really, uh, you know, uh, put a punctuation mark on the um, evidence that you've suggested. So the score A, uh, score A traits, you know, being fluent, good sentence structures, good use of vocabulary, uh, sound use of grammar, good spelling and punctuation, few slip, slips or error. So to be honest, personally, <coughs> sorry, personally, I found this section of the written part quite hard because I'm atrocious at grammar <laughs> um, uh, and uh, my handwriting is abysmal. Um, and so like, I was really worried about this section, but I think some key tips for me would just be to write neatly and we'll go into the breakdown of how you should you know use your time effectively so write neatly and um if you have some time at the end definitely double read through it again and double check your spelling and grammar so in terms of a format um so here's a uh, example question explain what you understand by this statement argue to the contrary um to the extent um to the to what extent do you agree that someone cannot be a good leader without learning how to follow. So what you wanna do is you wanna consider the definition. So you wanna explain the definition. A scientific man ought to have no wishes, no effects, uh, a mere heart of stone. Uh, so argue against it or for, depending on the question. And then you want some counter arguments as well to provide a balanced argument. And also um, to what extent do you agree um, with it? So you wanna provide a, objective argument and a subjective argument. So the balance is not just between pros and cons, but it's also between objective and subjective. Some key tips here, uh, do a mock essay to gauge your timing. So this is a really big tip. Um, I'll go through, I think that, yeah. So this, in terms of timing, I'll go through this first before going through the tips. In terms of um, timing, you want approximately two minutes to formulate, okay, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna say? what type of arguments are you going to make and then you want about 15 minutes to plan which seems like a really long time that's half of your time but it's trust me it's worth it because if you plan well it means that when you start writing you can literally just focus on the writing you don't have to worry about 
the arguments you're going to make. You're just worried about how you're going to formulate everything, how you're going to make it flow well, and how you're going to put pen to paper to, 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 so you can get those marks. And then you want 13 minutes of writing. This may be plus or minus for some people. So some people might need less time than this, significantly less time. Some people might need to, a little bit more time. That's why it's important to practice. Um, so again, you've got 30 minutes. It's not very a very long time. So I would say, don't think about it as a writing an essay. Think about it as writing three paragraphs. You're really just trying, I mean, writing three points, basically. You're trying to write an introduction that introduces kind of what you're writing about, your definitions, the points you're trying to make, the main body that has all your balanced arguments in it, that's cohesive, that's comprehensive, mm -hmm. that's concise. And then you want your um, conclusion to summarize, summarize and to, um, to bring a final point whether that's an objective or subjective or mixed um, conclusion. So now to go back to the tips. So you want to do mock essays. Um, so, I mean, uh, when I was prepping for this and also some research I did, uh, I did afterwards, it said you can do two or three. What I tried to do is I tried to do um, just like one every, one every day. So I think you guys don't have much time now. So if you just do um, one, one a day till till it comes up, then you can start to um, formulate how much time it takes you to do certain things, how much time it's taking you to write, how much time it's taking you to plan, um, how much time it's taking you to choose a question. Oh, looks like there were some people in the waiting room. Um, so how much time it's taking you to choose a question as well. And then you can work from there and you can really tailor it to yourself. But these, uh, this breakdown of timings is, a generic and pretty much standard um, breakdown of timings. So some other tips. Um, if you've already done a few mock full essays, and because you guys don't have much time, you might just be better off just planning. So just going through the, okay, let me choose a question. What would I say? And write down just like a series of points, a series of arguments for and against after you've gotten comfortable with that timing. So answer any of the questions you want. It's not really about answering the like more like um, theoretical questions or it's not about answering, oh, I'm gonna answer the quote because nobody else is gonna do the quote. Um, everybody's gonna do the medic one about whether we should allow euthanasia. And so I'm gonna do this rogue one that may be harder because um, I might score more points. They're not really looking at it like that. It's, they're literally just looking at the soundness of your arguments your ability to concisely and comprehensively um, show balanced point of view using objective and subjective arguments and then present um, uh, a solid conclusion. Um, so yeah, two or three points for and against. Again, like I said, make sure it's a balanced argument. Relate your answers to, uh, to medicine and topical issues, especially if you, you're answering the medical answer. But in general, remember we're trying, this is all trying to be doctors. Um, this is also trying to be a medical student and ultimately a medical professional. So um, tailor your answers in that general direction. Um, sorry, I think somebody might be, might not be muted. I, I'll, I'll, I'll just mute you. Okay. So um, unless, on, or did you have a question to ask? If so, just put it in the group chat and we'll come back to it. Um, so you can mention a study or two. Again, you're trying to demonstrate your breadth of understanding. I don't think, don't read, I wouldn't advise anyway, because especially because you don't have much time, but don't, don't be too concerned about reading extra papers and extra, extra history now. If you haven't already, I would, have, I would assume that you guys have done, a, done some reading around it since you're trying to get into medical school or some reading around the current affairs you know, things you can talk about, COVID-19, you know, that's, that's massive, um, obviously, it's affecting everyone, so that could be something you could talk about, but again, the main thing is just that you're making comprehensive um, and sound points, like points that actually make sense and are strong and solid. Um, if you're using, you know, multiple articles and things, and you understand them, and you're implementing them right, in the right way, fantastic. If you've just read it, for five minutes and you don't really know what it's talking about, don't include it because the likelihood is that you're probably not gonna understand how to use it properly and effectively. Um, 
consistently uh, use good grammar and vocabulary. This is why I say it's, it's good to think about adding some more time at the end to, or leaving some time at the end to just read through it if you can. And always includes a, include a, a, a conclusion, choose a side, no matter how hard that sounds. As long as it's not like really far-fetched, like don't put anything crazy. Don't start putting, yeah. Um, don't discuss Harold Shipman and then say, so I'm, I'm in support of what he did because obviously that's going to be problematic for your admission and you might get called in <laughs> for some, <laughs> some conversations. So don't, don't, don't do anything like really out there, but have a solid uh, stand on the side and stand on the side solidly based on the information you provided. Um, so yeah, just one final thing, I guess, like I said, you might need to leave some time at the end. So if you, even if you wanted to take a little bit of time from planning, maybe three, three minutes from your planning, so you'd give you 12 minutes to plan. Or if you want to take some time for your writing, because you know you're a quick writer, um, take a couple of minutes from your plan, from your writing. Um, you I've, need to do. Sorry. I've just, I've just had a look at the website and it's, it says normally where we'd get one A4 to write, they get 550 word limit. Um, okay. So obviously if you're typing, you're probably going to be a lot faster anyway, so you could probably spend more time planning. Yeah. Yeah, spend more time planning then. And if you're very lucky, maybe you even get a spell checker on your computer. Uh, don't 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 bank on it. But that, that's actually really useful information. Thank you, Axel. So yeah, if um if you're faster typing, obviously you're not going to need that much time to type. Um, but you you do want some time, even if it's a minute or two at the end, just to briefly read through everything, make sure your grammar's right, make sure your arguments actually make sense and make sure that your spelling is right. Cool, so um, we're gonna go through some essay analysis now. Um, and after that, we'll kind of open the floor to see whatever you guys want to touch on further and go from there. So in terms of essay analysis, um, we'll start with this question. So it says, the question we have is a little learning is a dangerous thing and it's by Alexander Pope. So the question wants you to explain what this statement means, argue to the contrary to show that a little learning is not dangerous and to what extent do you think you can be, to what extent do you think it can be a dangerous thing? So here the three questions are explain what this means, that's question one, argue against it and argue for it. So make sure you do each of those three things as you're answering the question. Does that make, I hope that makes sense to everyone. So moving on. So have an intro and your intro kind of doubles up as explaining the, what the statement means. So by stating this, a little learning, so I'll just read it out. Sorry, let me just move some of these things so I can see what I'm reading. Uh, so it says, by stating that a little learning is a dangerous thing, the author is implying that it is a safer, it's safer to know nothing about something than to know a little about it. And from the a misconception that you actually know more than, and form a misconception that you actually know more than you do. Um, so fantastic. They've introduced and they've also explained. Moving on. Um, we're looking at the main body now. So this main body is where you now want to do your for and against your balanced arguments. So firstly, you want to argue to the contrary as the question has asked you. So what, what type of things, what type of things would you guys be thinking to argue to the contrary about before we read through the example? Anyone? Like I said, please free feel feel free to unmute yourselves and say something. I'm not going to be a mean lecturer and unmute you for, for you and force you to <laughs> answer a question, but it would be nice if you are interactive. And you'll find that actually talking things through will help you remember it better for the actual BMAT because you'll be able to process things out loud and get some feedback on it as well. Okay, that's absolutely fine. So we'll go. We'll just go through the, to the example then. So um, I'll just read it out. So there, are, there are, however, many situations in which a little learning can be extremely beneficial. A basic knowledge of first aid can help to save a person's life, even if it is the mere banding of a bandaging of a wound. The fact that the individual may not be aware 
of the need to elevate an injury, an injured limb is often negligible, uh, of, of negligible importance in comparison to the little knowledge they had of the need to call for an ambulance and to keep the victim calm and reassured. Does that make sense to everyone? How that's a strong, well-reasoned argument against the statement that was made and thus a good answer to the question. I'm gonna assume that's a yes. Um, so yeah, again, things like grammar, grammar is strong, use of wording is strong, um, structure of the sentences are very strong and it flows nicely to the conclusion that yes, they didn't know how to do this part, but they did know how to do this part. And that was actually a good thing. In other circumstances, so I'm just gonna keep reading. In other circumstances, an individual who has witnessed a baby being delivered on television will be better equipped to assist in the emergency delivery of the baby than someone who has not had the same exposure to this little knowledge. They may not be able to, uh, they may not, they may not be at all as experienced as a midwife, but in emergency situations, it's better to have a little knowledge than to know nothing at all. Um, so again, that's the second point, um, strengthening the argument. If you've seen both of these, uh, if you notice both of these uh, arguments that have been made are very much medically orientated, which is one of the things that we were trying to say. So although they're not necessarily clinical in the sense that it, there's not much clinical knowledge that you need to know, and they're not expecting you to know a bunch of clinical knowledge, you're not medical students. Um, there is a leaning towards healthcare, which is important because it shows, first of all, uh, alludes to your understanding of healthcare issues, alludes to your, um, your inclination to healthcare, which is always good because that's what you're trying to go into. Is there any questions on that? Okay, then we'll move on. So the counter argument with a conclusion is going to be your third paragraph or your third bit of the th third bit of the written section. I'm going to assume that nobody wants to speak on this one as well and <laughs> just move on. Uh, so I'll read this out as well. The matter that determines whether or not learning is dangerous is the way in which the individual uses their knowledge. As long as they do not become too overconfident of what they have learned and do not use it to the harm of others, their knowledge is not dangerous. However, if someone viewing a heart transplant on television be believes they are now equipped to perform one themselves, then in that case, the little learning has become a danger, particularly if they have no concept of human physiology or surgical procedure. It is essential that knowledge is used cautiously and sensibly and never to the disadvantage of others. In this way, a little learning will not be dangerous. So can you see how they did have a conclusion there, even though it was literally a line at the end, but it is still a strong conclusion that shows the side that they've taken. They've decided that actually a little learning isn't dangerous if used appropriately. So they've concluded that a little learning is good if used appropriately as long as it's used appropriately. Does that make sense? So um, does anybody have any questions on that? Again, I'm not gonna go through each little thing. We've already talked about um, kind of the things you need to be incorporating in terms of language, in terms of vocabulary, in terms of grammar, in terms of spelling, in terms of the flow of your, of your written uh, section, in terms of making sure you're bringing about, in terms of answering the question, sorry, in terms of making sure you're bringing about good arguments that are balanced and ultimately coming to a conclusion. And I think this example does that very well. So it talks about the intro, which is also explained, um, defines a statement that the initial statement that's made, which means it answers the question. And then your against argument, which is what the question asked you for first. And then your for argument, which ended with the conclusion. Any good questions on that? You'll get these slides anyway, so you can look through it. 
to get a better idea. But I think what I would say is just for now, just plan, 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 work on your planning, work on making cohesive arguments that make sense. Um, so, so we know that this um, answer answers all of the sections. So it's definitely a three and it's probably an A as well because the grammar looked good to me. Um, is it balanced is the first question. The examples were effective, but they could have mentioned different perspectives um, because it was a little bit limited to medicine. Um, I know that sounds contradictory to what I said before, but if you have space, add more things. Again, if you were writing in on a piece of paper, you could write really small and see if you could get more points in. But in the, because you only have a certain word limit, on your computers, I would say, don't worry about that too much. Um, if you had the opportunity to bring two examples, maybe bring one medical and one non-medical, but start with a medical one or a healthcare inclined one, doesn't necessarily have to be medicine. Um, the conclusion could have been a bit more compelling, but I think they did a good job to um, incorporate that last sentence. Now he could have used, the, the individual could have taken more words from the second uh, part of their um, against argument um, could have taken some words out of there and utilized them in a stronger conclusion. Um, but I think they did adequately to um, did adequately to um, show that they came on one side of the argument or they stood with one side, whether that's for or against. Um, there's a question: How do you get above a three? Axa, do you want to take this one? Um, yeah, so I've just said in the chat as well that um, okay. only a medical perspective has been used here. And um, really, I think with BMAT, the SS section, you can do any point and it, it should get you the marks, it should get you the points. But obviously, if you limit if you limit them to one specific, because if you think about it, the two the two points, you could merge them together as one. Um, and you could you could think about, I, well, I can't think of anything on the spot, but there's so many other examples out there. And I guess you get that from your wider reading. So if you include different points, you should get well above a, above a three. I hope that answers your question. Uh, sh should I add something? Yeah, yeah, yeah please. Um, okay, so in terms of the question you tend to get asked, um, so you do have the science-based style of question, you do have the ethical one. So if you're quite familiar with ethics, then that would be a good way to go. However, you do limit yourself if you go through the, uh, if you do the ethic section and you know you, your knowledge on ethics is quite, if your knowledge of ethics is not really on point. And uh, the third ones tend to be a quote, which we've seen in the past, a lot of students performing very well by doing the quote question, as that opens your, gives you more opportunity to, to uh, expand on, um, on your on answering these, uh, these questions. So um, yeah, so one more thing I would like to say is that um, when answering just the question, the, the the first sentence when you're introducing uh, the topic, when you're writing your introduction, you know, try to reiterate the the question. Then, um, can you still hear me? It's saying my internet connection is not too good. Oh, okay. Great. Uh, then, um, you know, as David said, uh, state both sides of the argument for and against. So on one end, we have this. On the other end, and um, you know, try and back it up, provide an example, for example, provide an example, which does strengthen your argument. And uh, once you provide an example, uh, um, explain why you've, maybe you've provided that example. So um, as students applying to medicine, I'm sure you've got quite a bit of knowledge, uh, general knowledge. So uh, that would be ideal if you're choosing the quote, um, to write your essay, um, you know, there's some of, of us may be aware of the Roman Empire, uh, the philosophers such as Aristotle, Plato, um, John de Locke, uh, you know, uh, yeah. 
So if you decide to go through the, uh, the quote uh, section, then that would be more ideal to try and use the, uh, the philosophers using your history and uh, playing with it, really making use of that. And uh, yeah, and try and introduce your topic says uh, for on one end, we have this on the other end, ultimately. So those are a nice way to start your sentences. Mm. That's all loquacious. Yes. Eloquent. No, eloquent, not loquacious. You don't want to be loquacious. Loquacious is saying too, like rambling on. Eloquent is the word I'm looking for. Um, so the, yeah, this is, these are just some feedback comments we're going to uh, rattle through quickly. So this response benefits from being clear, simple and focused. It provides a narrow interpretation of that a little learning is problematic when it makes one overconfident to give a sample to give a simple but structured argument. The counter argument is effective using good counter examples and sensibly not trying to bring in additional knowledge, but it does not support a properly balanced consideration of the statement and constrains and cons in and constrains. Cons I think that's constraining views, but contrasting, sorry, contrasting views. Um, the last paragraph fails to um, realize that while the initial statement refers to a little learning, the final part of the question asks to what extent generally, uh, to what extent general learning can be a dangerous thing. So I think that's where you'd probably have boosted marks in this question to fully answer the, the last question asked in the main um, question. Um, so if we go back to it quickly, just so that we can be 100% clear what they're talking about. So like we said, there was the first question, a little learning is a dangerous thing, explain what the statement means and argue against it. And then the, the last question was to, to what extent do you think learning can be a dangerous thing? So it did answer that learning can be a dangerous thing, but it didn't necessarily argue to what extent it can be a dangerous thing. So obviously if you'd done that, then you've, you would have answered the question more fully and then that would have boosted you up to a four, 4.5 maybe even. Um, depending on how you tied them together. Um, so we, we could have done a practice, but we don't have much time. But again, the main things you want to focus on are planning, 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 thinking about the arguments you're going to make, answering the questions, all the parts of the question that you've chosen to answer. So here's just a summary. So again, make sure you do an explanation of the statement if you use the statement, or at least introduce the question by defining things within it. Um, Think about objective arguments and um, make sure you incorporate those. You don't always just want to use subjective, 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 because that's hearsay. Um, think about things that contradict your argument, providing a balanced argument and also a balanced conclusion. And then um, where you have the conclusion is where you want to inject some of your subjective uh, opinions, basically. Um, fi uh, so five points to remember uh, are slippery slope argument, Hi Hippocratic Oath, um, plus or minus kind of the GMC guidelines, uh, the limited nature of resources, where do you draw the line, and long run the short run, so kind of long term, looking at short term, long term and short term gain. Obviously, when COVID, so you can feel free to talk about COVID as well. So those are just, I guess it's six points really, six things you can talk about. Um, um, six points you can talk about, or six things you can consider, especially if you're thinking about the ethical question. Slippery slope argument is a really good one for the ethical questions. Um, Hippocratic oath can be used, you know, pretty much for any of the questions. Uh, limited nature of resources can be used for any of the questions. It just shows your understanding or and background of um, the current healthcare system that you want to apply for, and also just your general under, um, knowledge of the healthcare uh, system. Cool. Um, so, the sorry, start... would you mind uh, expanding what you mean with regards to the slippery slope argument? I don't quite, I'm not quite familiar with that. 
Okay, uh, fantastic. So the slippery slope argument, for instance, let's use uh, the topic of euthanasia. So if um, a slippery slope, uh, the argument that can be made that's the slippery slope argument is that, okay, let's say you start off with euthanasia and say only people who are very, very unwell and people who are really um, in a lot of pain, terminally ill, only going to live for three months, they're the people who are going to be uh, able to receive euthanasia. But then once that's put in place, what stops um, the bar from being pushed further back? So what stops them people saying, well, I, I have a mental illness that makes me feel like I'm terminally ill, I'm suicidal, I, I would rather die. So just take, I just want my life taken. So would mental illness then be considered as part of that euthanasia as well as physical illness in terms of terminal illness? And then you could say, okay, why is it 30? Why is it, why is it three months? Why might it not be longer? Why can't it be for up to a year if it's a life expectancy of a year? Or what if you have a neurodegenerative disease where you know that you're going to die eventually and you don't want to wait till you can't even dress yourself. You want to take your life now whilst you still have dignity. And so that's the slippery slope. You're going to keep pushing the bar back further and further and further back until you get to the point where regulating it becomes very very hard um and yeah so that would be the slippery slope argument the fact that you start somewhere but it's a slippery slope to the bottom in terms of like you keep pushing your boundaries back uh, and you keep broadening the uh the uh, criteria for whatever the action is for instance euthanasia does that make sense uh, yeah that's great thank you no problem. uh it's definitely for everyone a really good one to read up on because even if you don't use it in, even if you don't use it for the BMAT, once you get into medicine, you know, hopefully, um, like it's, it's such a big part of it, ethics, it's such a big, big part of ethics in medical ethics. So, and it will do everyone well in life to know about the slippery slope argument. It won't, it won't take away from your life, it will only add to it. And you'll need to know for interviews as well. Like. Yeah, and you'll need to know it for your interviews as well. Exactly. Thank you. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Because I think that was my last. Um... Um, yeah, the one tip that I would say is that um, I'm assuming loads of you might be studying biology, chemistry, maths, but um, we'll do like psychology or sociology on the side and sometimes stuff from there or English. Um, there's certain studies that you might have looked at that could come in really handy with the examples. So um, just think about like your wider knowledge as well. Yeah. So yeah, these are just some conclusions for section three. Um, obviously, number one doesn't really matter too much, but you can still do that by practicing on the computer, but just making sure you keep your word count. To, is it 550, you said? AXA, is it 550? 50, 50 words? I think, uh... She might have paused, but we'll double check that and get that back to you. Um, so yeah, define the relevant terms. Make sure you have three points for and against within your three parts of your argument three parts of your text. So you have your introduction, your middle bit, and your conclusion. Um, relate your answers to medicine and topical issues where possible, but make sure you provide a breadth of arguments, not just, you know, um, the same argument written differently. You know what I mean? And then mention a study or two, if you can. Um, there is a bit under here that says learn 10 to 12 studies. If you don't, you haven't learned studies till this point, like just learn one study, <laughs> to be honest, because you don't have time. Um, but if you have, then obviously incorporate them. Make sure you use good grammar. It's a must. You really want to score that A, B or A, A preferably if you can. It just stands you in good stead and balances out section two that you may have struggled a bit more on. And always include a conclusion that makes you fall on one side or the other of the argument. Um, so that's section three. Overall tips. Um, so for section one, again, keep those things in mind. What is the conclusion? What is the assumption that is being made? And what is the question actually asking me? It's really, really important. Um, and then um, for section two, be aware of your time. Be aware of your time. Be aware of your time. Um, I've seen the question. I'll answer that after I've gone through the tips. Um, so yeah, be aware of your time. If you don't know something, move on. For section three, don't, for section three, coming to section three with a fresh mind. Section two is probably going to beat a lot of people up. It beat me up badly. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but yeah, it's probably going to um, be quite rocky um, just because it's just so time pressured. Um, 
And so it's not that you're not capable of answering the questions necessarily, but it's just so time pressured that you might not be able to get there quick enough. So take a deep breath, go into section three, breathe. You have plenty of time in section three to write your essay. I mean, to, to think about what question you wanna write, to plan it and to write it. So take a deep breath and slow your heart rate down, slow yourself down as you're answering section three um, so that you are providing a cohesive and comprehensive uh, piece of work. Remember, grammar is important, structure is important, and answer all the questions. If there's one thing you've gotten out of this, make sure you answer the questions. I'll say it one more time. Make sure you answer the questions. <laughs> That's the most important thing. Um, so um, some of the questions that we have at the bottom here. So the first one is, where do we go uh, to get the studies from? Um, any, I, I would say BMJ. Any, any other uh, additions, uh, Chris or AXA? And the topics on that um, slide, you can just Google them and there's loads of um, like BBC News articles, stuff like that to read. Um, the actual studies, I think it will be, it's a bit late to read studies yeah. now, you might not understand them, you might start panicking. So leave the studies out, but um, the Mid-Staffordshire Scandal and NHS Reforms, um, prioritization these are all things that if you do like an hour at the weekend you can just read them really fast and they're quite simple on the um news articles so yeah just just google them and they should come up okay okay yeah uh, we will email uh the the slides we'll have to do it tomorrow because we have the mmi that's happening tomorrow morning and afternoon so we, we're gonna we are going to be a bit busy running that so, uh, but we wish you all the best with your uh, your exam. Uh, we also have the uh, the interview. We do have an interview session on the following week after your after your exam. So, uh, hopefully, if you want to attend, that would be great. Uh, Oscar, you came to the one last year, right? Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah I think it was really good. Yeah. So, then uh, and great. Uh, we always love to have people coming back and being part of the team, like Aska is, is part of the team as well. So that, that that's how we, we like doing things, you know, bring people back. <laughs> David, you came to our event, how many years ago? That oh, was like- Oh my gosh, like <laughs> five years ago? Yeah, yeah, so um, you came to long time ago. first ever event. Yeah. And, um, he's been with us since. So he's, he's, he's one of the leaders, you know, the top leaders in, in Mexico. Yeah. Do you guys have any other tips for everyone before we let them go? Axel, I'm thinking about you uh, specifically because obviously you've done it more recently. I think my biggest tip would just be to keep an eye on the time for section two. Um, and even section one, sometimes you can, like you sometimes your ego doesn't let you go forward because you want to answer that question and figure it out. But um, leave it, just get on to the next question. They're all worth one mark, even if it takes you five minutes and some might take you 30 seconds and there might be easier ones at the end. Um, section two is really really time limited so just leave it if you don't know we just just completely skip it and just select the default answer maybe just keep like i don't know a or c as your um answer for anyone that you don't know but always answer the question um and then section three is usually um quite good for time and don't worry about spending too long planning because 10 15 minutes is actually decent um yeah yeah that's it yeah anything to add chris or you good uh, no, but thank you for attending this uh, masterclass and uh, we wish you all the best with your exam and your future.